안녕하세요. 오스템 임플란트 교육 연구원장 조인호입니다. Greetings, I'm Dr. Joino, Master Course Director of Austin Implant Research Center. Today, I want to talk about the biomechanics and occlusion of implant prosthesis among prosthodontic master course. Today, let me introduce one of the important factors that determine dental implant success, biomechanics and occlusion of dental implant prosthesis. I hope you take note of this lecture as you provide prosthesis. This lecture involves how to find the right balance between the load balancing capacity and the anticipated occlusal force of implant. First, I'm going to talk about difference of biomechanism between dental implant and natural tooth. Second, balance between load-bearing capacity of implant and occlusal load. I'm going to talk about how to achieve balance between that. Finally, when there is imbalance, I'm going to talk about what kind of complications there could be. First, let's look at the difference of biomechanism between dental implant and natural tooth. The biggest difference, as you all know, is the presence of periodontal ligament. With natural tooth, you have periodontal ligament, which absorbs the shock. Also, the diameter and size differ. Variety symmetry differs. Vitality proprioception exists within a natural tooth, but doesn't in implants. There's difference in property between implants and natural tooth. To put it simply, compared with natural tooth, the implant in many ways has more unfavorable conditions. First, let's talk about the balance between load-bearing capacity of implant and occlusal load. What kind of things should we consider? Let me give you a metaphor. This is a carrier and the load that goes on top of the person. This is a metaphor that I use frequently. If the worker or carrier is healthy and has appropriate amount of load, that person can go on for long distances, but if the carrier is weak and has excessive load, you can see that there could be problems within short period of time. Load balancing is very important. It is, in essence, about how strong the implant and implant prosthesis are. Also, we need to consider how much load that goes on top of first, Let's look at load-bearing capacity. This falls under implant, whether implant has been placed correctly, if the implant has appropriate length and diameter, and whether implant has been placed so that axial load could be applied whether there's been angulation in terms of implant placement and what kind of abutment that has been chosen. These are factors that affect the load-bearing capacity. Another is whether there's appropriate interface between implant and bone. This is affected whether the implant has appropriate roughness. Another point is that the bone quality of the site in question. We need to think about that. In terms of unanticipated occlusal force, this will be addressed in detail later. We need to think of number of implants in terms of load-bearing capacity of dental implant. 
Let's say that three natural teeth have been extracted in the posterior area. The amount of load that is applied differ when two implants are placed and bridges provided and when three implants, along with bridge, have been provided. If we do bridge and if occlusal force is concentrated in the pontic area, there can be bending moment and various complications can occur. When I was working at Tanguk University, I looked into comparison whether there were any differences when I placed two implants in the posterior region and three implants in the posterior region in number 6 and 7 along with sinus lift. We looked into 74 implants and 9 failed. At the time, because it was early phase, the failure rate was quite high. Out of 9, 8 implants were where 2 implants were placed. And only one case failed when 3 implants were placed. As shown, with less load that is applied on the implant, the percentage of implant failure goes down. Let's think of implant length. These days, a lot of people use 7 mm implant, but when we look at finite element analysis, you can see the difference. There's 13 mm, 10 mm, and 7 mm implants. Up to 10 mm, you can see that in the apex area and flange, the stress is dispersed. But if you look in 7 mm implant, if you look at the apex area and the flange, the stress is concentrated like this. Therefore, we recommend that 10 mm implant should be placed. As shown in this slide, if you place a 7 mm implant and if excessive stress or occlusal load is applied, failure can occur. Next is the diameter of the implant. Compared with a narrow diameter implant, it is better to use wide diameter implant. Wide diameter implant has many advantages such as broad contact area. However, if there is insufficient amount of bone width, we cannot use a wide diameter implant. When the amount of bone width is limited just because you use a wide implant, it does not mean you'd be able to get good results. You need to have sufficient amount of bone width to be able to use wide implants and to gain good results. Next is implant position. By implant position, the occlusal force transferred from the antagonist should be in axial force. Axial force should be applied. If you look at implant, it can withstand axial force, but it is very susceptible to lateral force. It is very vulnerable, therefore we need to find the right implant position so that axial force is applied by the antagonist. We can assume that we have the liver cantilever design after placing the implant. We can also assume a situation where there's wide occlusal table and where it's been tilted to one direction. If occlusal force is applied to the area where cantilever is designed, bending moment or lateral force can be increased. As shown in this image, a lady is carrying a bottle of water. Even if it is heavy, if she has the right balance and has axial force, you can see that the lady can carry the bottle of water for long distance without any worry, but it, as shown on the right, if she is carrying a little baby and if the baby has a fit, in other words, lateral force, if it is applied, the lady would not be able to carry the water for a long time and the bottle can fracture. I'm not sure whether this is a right metaphor, but 
It is the same with implant. If a bending moment occurs instead of axial force, it will cause a negative impact on the implant. We need to position the implant right so that the antagonist can provide axial force. In the past, we have used these techniques to find the right position. Some people still use it these days. You use a diagnostic wax up and make a surgical stent using this. An implant was placed. These days, CAD programs are used and using digital technique, one guide can be fabricated. Awesome has one guide system. If you use one guide system, you can get accurate implant position and axial force can be applied to the implant. When you place implant, at times it is placed in an angled manner. In the case of upper, in order to avoid sinus, as shown on the image, it can be placed in an angled manner to avoid the sinus. If you look at the panoramic image, it has been placed in an angled manner to avoid the sinus. In the lower, this is all on five in the mandible. Five implants have been placed in order to avoid the mental frame and you can see that the all on five have been placed in an angled manner. In this case, there are precautions. If you look at the finite element analysis, 0 degrees, 30 degrees, up until 30 degrees at the flange, the stress is not concentrated, but if it exceeds 30 degrees and 40 degrees, the stress is concentrated and you can see band is formed. Therefore, when you place the implant in an angled way, you need to bear in mind not to exceed 30 degrees. In the Dr. Carranza's clinical periodontology textbook in page 275, the finite element analysis is under my name. Let's look at about my connection type. Depending on whether the abutment is one piece, two piece, three piece, there can be different options. So you can also think of internal and external connection. Let's look at the finite element analysis. In the case of two piece abutment, more so than when using two piece abutment, three piece abutment leads to far less stress. Therefore, when choosing abutment system, we need to consider whether the implant is a staunch or whether it is unfavorable. Depending on the situation, you can choose between two-piece and three-piece abutments. Between internal and external connection, because the load balance is lower in the case of internal connection, it is more favorable. Next, the implant surface. When I was studying in 1996 at Brunei Clinic in Sweden, at the time, the standard was to use smooth surface implant. There was no other option. In 2010 and beyond, with continued research, implant surface switched from smooth surface to rough surface. The superiority was proven and all implant companies provide rough surface implants. Appropriate rough surface is right. It shouldn't be too rough or too smooth. When we talk of roughness, we talk about RA and SA. The surface should have about RA SA of 1.5 to 2.0. Professor Thomas L. Braxton worked with Professor Bronemark at the Bronemark Clinic in Sweden and Professor Albrechtson, I'm sure you've already learned it from your textbooks, but he talked about six factors that affect osseointegration. In the third criteria, there is implanted surface. The image on the right is the dental school within the Bronemark Clinic and there's a research center that belongs to Professor Thomas Albrechtson. About five years ago, there was a Europe 
implant Congress in Madrid at the time, Professor Albrechtson mentioned that now the day of rough surface has dawned upon us. He compared a rough surface along with smooth surface implants. When we use rough surface implant, unlike in the past, we can use shorter implants. In the past, we emphasized the longer implants that range from 12 millimeter to 20 millimeter. But as we transition to rough surface, the range from 6 millimeter to 13 millimeter would suffice. Next is bicortical stabilization. In the past, we emphasized that cortical bone from both top and bottom should be engaged, but the emphasis on this has become much less these days with rough surface. After placing implant in the past, we would wait three months to six months. We would wait for maturation, but these days we would either submerge it or expose it using healing abutment in the past and the lower. The healing period for the lower was three months and six months for the upper. That was ideal in providing prosthesis, but these days the period has become much reduced. You can provide a prosthesis within one or two months, or you can also provide immediate implant placement. Because of rough surface, the success rate does not differ much. In the past, the success rate between upper and lower was about 10%. If you look over here, it is 91% and 81%. However, with the dawn of rough surface, the success rate between upper and lower are very similar. If you use rough surface, these days it is very important to use rough surface appropriately. The bone quality of the site in question is also another important factor. Zarb and Professor Albrechtson suggested a way to evaluate the bone quality type 1 to 4. They mentioned that type 2 and type 3 show high success rate. What they emphasize is that rather than cortical bone, cancellous bone affect the success rate of implant. There needs to be a lot of vascularization for bone formation, and hence type 2 and 3 are mentioned. What I'm showing you on right is the bone of a cow, which I've received from a restaurant. And I compared type 1, 2, 3, 4 bones. The below image is when I had done stability tests using perio test on my students when I was teaching in college. The test was done from central incisor to second molar and on students with natural tooth instead of ones with bridges. In the graph, number three is the canine area. The anterior area are all in negative, and number six and seven are positive. Yes, the canine has long root, and the upper number six and seven, they have three roots. 3 to 1, it's no comparison, but when I did perio test in the canine area, it was negative, so you can see that the stability in that area was quite high. When we place implant, bone quality matters significantly. This is what I want to emphasize to you. Next, up until now, we talked about the A load bearing capacity implant, number of implants, and the interface between bone and implant. And I've also mentioned the importance of the health of the carrier or the implant. This is so that the implant can bear the load. Next, I'm going to talk about B. So this is expected occlusal load and the burden that goes on top of the carrier and how much stress that is caused. What kind of adjustment is necessary? First is the occlusal factor. Compared with natural tooth, 
the occlusal table needs to be smaller so that the stress can occur less. When we design implanted prosthesis, buccolingually compared with natural tooth, it should be reduced by one-third or one-fourth. Also, in the case of most posterior tooth, mesiodistally, the distal surface needs to be reduced as well. In, if you look at the prosthesis design below, compared with the buccolingual width of natural tooth, the implant's buccolingual width is smaller. Next is cuspal inclination. If the cuspal inclination is deep, as shown on the image, compared with when it is flat, lateral movement and bending moment can be bigger, and if it is flat, it can be smaller. 0 degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, you can see that the difference increases. When we provide implanted prosthesis design centric relation, we need to have contact and centric relation in order to grind food, but when a lateral movement is done, if canine or premolar is natural tooth, it should be guided by natural tooth and in the posterior area where implant has been placed, it should be discluded. As shown on the image in centric occlusion, it is in contact, but during lateral movement, there is disclusion. In other words, when there is a lateral movement, if the antagonistic cusp is in contact with implant prosthesis, there can be bending movement, therefore we need to prevent that. Next is cantilever. We can think of uh, cantilever in bridge and edentulous cantilever cases. First, in bridges, buccolingual cantilevering can be considered. If there's a dentulous ridge in the upper and if there's a lot of bone resorption, if you place the implant naturally, it will be palatally positioned. If you make a prosthesis on top of the palatally positioned implant, as shown on the image, cantilevering could be excessive. So when people chew, bending moment can occur. In this case, you need to make it crossbite if the patient does not have aesthetic issues. So the mandibular would protrude out and the upper will be retruded to reduce the cantilevering effect. And there's also mesiodistal cantilevering in this case. It would be better if three implants could be placed, but at times you only need to place in one place and need to do cantilever. If you look at the cantilever design in the lower, as there's when there's mandibular movement, masseter muscle is towards the back. If you look at the figures, it is 100 in the ramus area and 70 in the molar area, and in the anterior area is 30. The more distal you go, in other words, the more force is concentrated. When you do mesiodistal cantilevering, you need to avoid doing distal cantilevering. As shown on the x-ray, it is better to do mesial cantilevering. In the case of edentulous cases, if you do a lot of cantilevering design towards the distal side, this is not ideal. In the most distal implant and the implant in the front, the distance between that has impact. The length of the distal cantilever should not exceed two times of this distance. If the distance between the most distal implant and mesial implant is 10 mm, it should not exceed 20 mm in the case of cantilever design. As shown here in this image, if it is 1 to 5, in this image, the distal length of cantilever design is 5 millimeter and 20 millimeter. This is a photoelastic analysis. 
If this was used to compare the 5 millimeter and 20 millimeter in the case of photoelastic analysis, if there's more stress, more patterns appear, as shown on the image on the right. This is 20 millimeter cantilever design. You see much more patterns here. Therefore, if possible, we need to avoid excessive cantilever design. This is crown to implant height. There's crown to implant ratio. Number seven, it's almost one on one. If you look at number six, it's about one on 1.5. When we think about crown to implant ratio, it should not exceed one on one. In the end, number six, as you can see, implant has fractured. Crown to implant ratio, we need to factor this in. If it exceeds 1 on 1 and becomes 1 on 1.5 or 1 on 2, then you need to increase the number of implants to be placed and reduce such impact. Let's look at parafunctional habits such as bruxism. Bruxism patients have a strong occlusal force. If the patient has bruxism, we can uh, detect such patients when we do oral inspection. There can be a lot of wear or porcelain fracture. If you notice this, then you be able to notice that this patient has strong occlusal force. When you come up with treatment plan for that patient, we need to place wider implants and reduce occlusal table to reduce occlusal force. Also, decrease the cuspal inclination, therefore minimizing interference upon lateral force. In the case of a porcelain occlusal table, there can be higher percentage of fracture, therefore it is important to provide a gold occlusal table. And when the patient sleeps at night, you need to tell the patient to wear the night guard in order to minimize the effects of bruxism. This is my patient. This is a female patient. It's been about three, four years since implanted delivery. The patient complained of mobility when I looked at number six and seven. The implants are all fractured. Number six, it's broken in the middle. And in number seven, it's fractured in the cervical area. You can only imagine how strong her occlusal force is. This has led to implant prosthesis fracture. Bruxism patients normally show resorption in alveolar bone. Unlike natural tooth, when alveolar bone of implant is reduced, it is resorbed in U-shaped form, like a well, and it leads to destruction of osseointegration. One of the symptoms you can catch early on is a screw loosening and mobility leading to fracture. As mentioned, what kind of results will occur if there are imbalance between load-bearing capacity of implant and expected occlusal load? What kind of complications could there be? As shown here, if there's excessive load, if it surpasses that of implant, as mentioned, the carrier may be unhealthy, and if the load is too much in implant, as shown in the bruxism patient, similar patterns could be observed. Alveolar bone resorption and destruction of osseointegration, screw loosening and fracture. The fracture of implant itself and implant prosthesis fracture could be observed. Let me summarize my lecture first. I've talked about the, the difference of my biomechanism between dental implant and natural tooth. The, the biggest one is lack of periodontal ligament. So there is no shock absorbing mechanism. 
In the case of natural tooth, depending on anterior tooth, posterior tooth, there are different shapes, but the, as for the implant, it's just round and the diameter can be wider and length may be longer. There is a little deviation. Implant is in many ways more unfavorable than natural tooth, so we need to protect the implant using different methods. Reaching a balance in implant prosthesis is quite very is quite important. Load bearing capacity needs to be improved and expected occlusal force needs to be reduced. In order to increase the load bearing capacity, you can place appropriate number of implant and choose appropriate implant length and diameter. You need to place the implant in the correct position so that axial force can be applied and when placing implant, if possible, you need to avoid any inclination. You need to factor these in to place the implant and to perform its load bearing capacity. Another important factor is implant surface. You need to choose appropriate rough surface. You need to choose the right type of implant so that osseointegration occurs successfully. You need to also consider the bone quality of the site in question. In terms of reducing expected occlusal force, as occlusal factor, you can reduce occlusal taper and you need to try to avoid cantilever design. Crown to implant ratio should not exceed one on one. You need to check if the patient has parafunctional habits. You need to consider various factors so that no excessive force is applied on the implant prosthesis. You need to improve the load bearing capacity and reduce the expected occlusal force so that the right balance could be achieved. In the case, if such balance is broken, there can be bone resorption or destruction of osseointegration screw loosening fracture. Implant prosthesis fracture can occur as complications. Today, we've looked at biomechanics and occlusion of implant. In light of longevity of implant prosthesis, if possible, you need to apply smaller occlusal force and place appropriate number of implants in the right position. You also need to make sure osseointegration is maintained and to minimize the bone resorption. These are very important in providing implant prosthesis. Because of time constraint, I've laid it out in a brief manner. I hope you stick to these principles and provide treatment to get good results. If you're interested in something deeper, please refer to Austin Implant Prosthodontic Master Course. It'll be deeply appreciated. Thank you for watching.